Hey, this morning, uh, we're going to jump into God's Word. If you have a copy of God's Word, uh, we're going to be in Haggai, and I'm going to read that scripture in just a little bit, but I wanted to tell you ahead of time, because it might take you a couple of minutes to find Haggai. It's not typically a book you typically go to, but I'll give you a hint. Turn to Matthew. You're familiar with that. Take a left-hand turn, uh, just three little books, and you'll be right there to Haggai, and we'll be reading there in just a moment. So I want you to know, a couple of years ago, a friend of mine turned me on to this idea of juicing. I don't know if you've heard of what juicing is, but it's basically you take some fruits and you take some vegetables that you should be eating on your plate, but because you don't like the taste of them or you don't think you're going to do all that, you're going to throw them through a juicer, and it's going to make a cup of juice, and basically you can drink your vitamins and minerals and vegetables for the day. Well, he taught me how to do that a couple of years ago, and so from time to time, trying to be healthy, I'll do some juicing. And so I'll take some kale, and I'll take some green beans, and maybe an apple, and some carrots, and some celery, a little lime uh, wedge, and a few other things, and put it through the juicer, and I'll drink it, and it tastes about as bad as it sounds, uh, but it's all in a purpose to make me healthier. Well, it takes a little bit of time and energy, and you got to clean the juicer. And so many times when I'm in a pinch, I won't do my own juicing. I'll go to the store to try to buy some juice that someone else has put together. And in my household, my wife does most of the grocery shop, and I don't. And so I hadn't been down the juice aisle in many, many years. And I don't know if you've been down the juice aisle, but there is an explosion of juices that have happened. I mean, I don't want to sound you know, too old, but back in my day, you had your apple juice and your orange juice, and that was about it. Well, now you got every combination you can imagine. You want banana orange, you want apple cranberry, you want, you know, pineapple and guava, whatever you want, there's a combination there. But again, call me old-fashioned, call me traditional. I really like just plain old, good old-fashioned orange juice. Now, There's some things that I have learned about orange juice. And I know, for example, if I go to a farmer's market or if I go buy it off the shelf, if I want the best experience of that orange juice, the the best value for my dollar, the best taste, there's something I need to do before I drink the orange juice. What is it? You have to shake it. Because if I were to just open it, And take a drink out of it, I would just get what? Kind of faintly flavored orange water. You know and I know that if we want the best out of that orange juice, we've got to shake it. And that the longer we shake it, the better that it's going to taste. Because when you look at orange juice, you have kind of almost two different substances in there. On the top, you've got kind of a clear liquidy water. But on the bottom, kind of as a thick substance, that's the pulp, right? That's the good stuff. It's all in there, but it has to be shaken in order to get the best out of it. Friends, you know, sometimes God has to shake us to get the best out of us. It's all in there. And for example, for us as believers, we have the Holy Spirit in us. When we've come to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, it mixes with the humanity of our personality and who we are and our gifts and our skills and abilities. And when God shakes us, it's almost like an anointing that God can do great work in and through us. So the question today is, has God ever shaken you? Has God ever rung your bell? He's kind of got your attention. Maybe it was a bad health report. Maybe it was a relationship that kind of went south. Maybe it was a wayward child. Maybe it was a financial strain. Maybe it was a job loss. But I am venturing to guess at one point or another, God has shaken each of us. And in fact, if you look over this past year, some people have said, God has shaken the entire world with this whole COVID thing. Now, many times what happens, right, when we're shaken by God is we just want it to be over. So we just start to pray things like this. God, I just want to get through this. God, remove this. God, take this away. 
In fact, even with COVID, people have been kind of praying that and everything, whereas I believe perhaps God's trying to teach us some things through it. So there are some things in life that you can't just pray away. You can't just obey away. You just have to go through it. And so the way I pray about those things is, God, use this until you choose to remove this. God, use this until you choose to to remove this. Today in the scripture, we're going to see how God shook up the Israelites. I want to put a little context to it now that hopefully you have found it. The Israelites have been in captivity. Nebuchadnezzar came in, destroyed the whole city, took the Israelites away, and for 70 years they were in captivity. And now they're making their way back to Jerusalem, which was once a beautiful city. Homes, businesses, the temple, all of that, they've come back and it's just in ruins. And here is what the Lord Almighty says in Haggai chapter 1, verses 2 through 11. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, The time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy With his own house. Then switching over to chapter 2, verse 6, and we'll look back at this one again. This is what the Lord Almighty says In a little while, I'll once more shake the heavens and I'll shake the earth. I'll shake the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and the desired of all nations will come, and I will fill my house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. Oh man, what a picture we have here that is going on. So after being in captivity, the Israelites come back and they were now standing in Jerusalem, which was once a wonderful built up city, but now it just lays in ruins. And you and I have seen this played out on TV, right? A tornado comes through, an earthquake comes through, and invariably there's a news reporter there with a person standing amongst a heap of rubble, which used to be their home, <clears throat> and they're crying, and they, the, the word comes, what are you going to do next? And what invariably do they always say? We're going to rebuild. We're going to rebuild. And that's the situation the Israelites were in. They come back. Their homes are destroyed. Their businesses are destroyed. The temple is destroyed. And so they do what we would do. They begin to rebuild their homes. No one can fault them for that. But what is interesting is they, as they begin to rebuild their homes, they begin to get more and more involved in their own pursuits and in their own interests. And then before you know it, their houses are rebuilt. They're putting on additions in the temple. God's place is still in ruins. And it's not just in ruins for a couple of years or even a decade. 16 years The temple, the worship center is just in ruins. Now, people had to have walked by it. And think about it. Children had to have been born and probably pointed and said, Mom, Dad, what's that pile of rubble there? Oh, yeah, that's where the church used to be. We'll get around to that some other day. But imagine for 16 years, there's no spiritual epicenter in this community. There's no place to worship. And it makes me wonder and think about the status of church within the United States. What would it be like if there was no place to worship here in North Fork? 
Recent surveys have shown that pre-COVID, between 5,000 and 7,000 churches close every single year. To break that out, that's between 75 and 100. So today, 75 to 100 churches are meeting and probably saying this is the last time we're going to meet. We're closing shop. Some of the statistics that after COVID are as high as 20%. One in five churches are going to close because they haven't adjusted and adapted post-COVID. Now, I'm not here today to be a prophet of gloom and doom, believe me, but I do believe every church needs to ask this question. If we closed our doors, would the community even notice? Would the community even care? And if the answer ever comes back, well, we're not sure, we don't even think they would notice, then perhaps the mission and vision of that church needs to adjust to be sure it is truly reaching its community for the Lord. The people here, the Israelites, again, pass and, and are just saying that, well, we'll get to it eventually. And that does not sit well with the Lord, as you can see. They are doing various things, but they are not satisfied. They are going through and neglecting the spiritual things for other things of life. And you and I can do the same exact things, can't we? Oh, I'll get around to the spiritual things, but I'm so busy with work, or I'm busy with grandchildren, or I'm busy just living life and going through the routine that I know I need to have a personal time with the Lord every day. I know I should serve at the church, but once the other things of life settle down, then I'll get to it. I hear people in my age bracket say that all the time. Once I retire, then I can serve a little bit more with the church. Then I'll have more time. But as you saw in that scripture, the people were putting clothes on and not warm. They were putting money in their purses. It wasn't staying in. They were not satisfied as if there is a connection that if you neglect the spiritual things of life, it's going to affect every other aspect of life. And if you're a believer, you know that to be true. And so God gives this warning in verses 5 and 7 where he says, Give careful thought to your ways. Now that may be the word for some of us here that we need to hear today. Maybe there's something going on and a decision we need to make. And God not only says it in verse 5, but he says it in verse 7. And I don't know about you, but I think if God has to repeat himself, it's pretty important. Give careful thought to your ways. The passage really points that whole connection between those things that are spiritual and the other things of life. And I really like what the great uh, 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon said when he said, a Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to a person who's not. What's your Bible look like? Are you spending time with the Lord? Because as you spend time with the Lord, that's going to help you in the relationships of your life. When you are faithful with your giving to the church and giving to the Lord's work, it's going to help you with the financial matters of life. There's this connection and tie that is there. And in verse 9, God says to them, You expected much, but you got little because you have neglected me. It's time to rebuild the temple. It's time to get your priorities in line. And I love what it says in Haggai 2.6. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and I'll shake the earth. I'll shake the sea and I'll shake the dry land. I'll shake all the nations and the desired of all nations will come and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord. He says, my house used to be filled with glory and now it's just lying in utter ruins. And that can't be. It will once again be filled with my glory. But what a prayer. God, shake us. Anybody wake up this morning and say that? That's not the way we like our Christianity, is it? We don't don't wake up and say, God, just shake us up a little bit. Quite honestly, we want comfortable, easy Christianity. We pray things like, God, let life go easy. God, let everything work out. God, let me get a close parking spot when I pull up to the grocery store. God, let me make the green lights. You know, God, service me. Make it easy so my life is just smooth. And God says, no, sometimes I have put a lot in you, and I'm going to have to shake you to get something out of you. Now, you may say to me, Pastor, who are you to come in here and talk like that? You don't know what's going on in my life. 
I think that uh, I am being shaken up, uh, but I don't know. Is God shaking me or is the devil messing with me? Is there a demon trying to get me? And that's a great question because sometimes we have a rough patch of life. Some things happen we don't expect and we simply want to say, well, it must be the evil one. And so I want to go back to the juice to kind of just decide the difference. Because when I buy this juice, I know that as long as this cap is sealed tight, I can shake this as much as I want, right? When God is shaking us, it's not to destroy us, it's constructive. It's not to break us down, it's to build us up. When Satan is fooling with us and shaking our life up, it's to make a mockery of your faith, it's to make a mockery of your marriage, it's to make a mockery of who you are and who you say you are. So when God shakes us, it's like keeping the cap on. Now, if I take this cap off, and I start to shake it, what's going to happen? It's going to be a mess. Those who clean the, the uh, sanctuary are going to be upset at the visiting preacher today. So I'm not going to do that. But you get the point. When God shakes us, it's to help us. It's to grow us. Sometimes we need to be shaken up because we've got too settled in our ways. It's kind of like when you do the wash, right? You put your clothes into the washing machine, and some amazing stuff happens in there. You throw in some soap, and what happens? How do those clothes actually become clean? They become agitated. They kind of rub up, and the friction with rubbing together uh, happens within there, and you pull them out, and they are clean. There are some times that God will shake us up. And it might agitate us a little bit, and we might want to just pray, God, let it be over, rather than praying, God, use this until you choose to remove this so that you can get out of me what you have put into me. Now, here's the reality. Every single one of us who is a believer in Jesus Christ has been shaken at one point or another. Whether you were eight years old and it was kind of the next logical step, but God shook you that you needed to come into a relationship with Jesus, or whether you're 18 years old or whether you're 88 years old, God shook you to get your attention that you needed a Savior. In fact, I got a good friend who he grew up around church life and uh, went to church, knew all the Sunday school answers to everything, but really didn't take it to heart. And one day in his early 20s, he was driving along, he fell asleep, he ended up running into the back of an 18-wheeler that took the top off of his car. When the police got there, they thought for sure no one would live through that accident. And my friend says when he opened his eyes, the bumper of that 18-wheeler was just about 6 to 10 inches from his face. And on the bumper was a bumper sticker that said, Live for Jesus. You know why he got the message? And so whether your conversion experience was as dramatic as that or whether it was just kind of a natural step, God shook you at one point or another. And so you might say, well, God has shaken me once. So why does God still shake us? Well, let me go back to the juice. Obviously, this is a big juice. Now, when I buy my juice, just like you, I shake it and I pour it and I drink it and it's great. But I can't drink all of it, so what do I do? I put it in the refrigerator. And you know what? Some amazing stuff happens in the refrigerator. That juice, it just begins to relax. It just begins to calm down a little bit. And as it's kind of chilling out in that refrigerator, some things begin to happen. What was once all of this stuff mixed together, the pulp begins to settle, right? The pulp begins to go to the bottom and the liquid begins to come to the top. And while it's all still in there, if I were to just reach in and grab it and drink it, it would be nothing more than faintly flavored orange water. You know, some of us, God shook us and we came into a relationship with him and we got involved with the church. We began to do those things. But now we kind of settled into the refrigerator of church life. And we're kind of just enjoying the coolness of church life. And things are beginning to settle down. And while that Holy Spirit is still in us, it's kind of, kind of gone to the bottom. And nothing is more dangerous when you've got a whole church full of people that are just relaxing in the refrigerator of church life. 
And you want to know what will shake them up sometime? Is a new believer comes and they've been shaken up and they want to jump in and they want to do some things in the church. And the other rest of us are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Just enjoy the refrigerator of church life. Just calm down. Relax. It's going to chill. Let it all be okay. And here's what God says. That will not stand. It's still in there. The Holy Spirit is still in there. But if you were to kind of take a drink, you would be little more than faintly flavored Christian. And so God shakes us to get our attention. Could God be shaking North Fork? Could God be shaking the churches of the D.C. area to do something so that God will be glorified as big or as small as that might be? You see, because some of us, we're just chilling in that refrigerator of church life and we're stuck on the same spiritual step. You're saying the same boring prayers to God every day and He's tired of hearing them. You're praying and stuck on the same spiritual step. You have the same temptations you're failing at. Your Bible reading has just become stagnant. You are very little more than just a pulse on the blip of the Christian heart monitor. That you're still there, but you're not on fire as you used to be. You're not as excited about what the Lord can do. Perhaps you've gotten to relax. And God says, I need to shake you because you are not ready for the next step that I want to bring you through. Next time you get a juice, I want you to know there's a deep theological uh, statement on every bottle of juice. It's short. Right here it is. Shake well. Say it with me. Shake well. Well, what a prayer. God has invested in you. God has invested in me. There have been people who spoke truth to your life, and now God wants you to speak truth to those people's lives, whether it's children or grandchildren or other people around you, but God will shake us to get the best out of us because he has put so much in us. And so today, maybe you need to reorder your priorities. Maybe you need to quit neglecting spiritual things for the material things. And when God shakes you, maybe you need to thank God. God, you're shaking me because you're going to use this for your very glory. You know, when you read the Old Testament, sometimes the Israelites, they didn't do the right thing. But in this particular scenario, they did. In fact, if you move forward to chapter 2, verse 19... They begin to lay the foundation for the new temple. And I think this is so cool. And God says to them, from this day forward, I will bless you. And here's how that happened. You remember it was Solomon's temple. And now they begin to lay the foundation for the new temple, which Herod will come in and is going to make bigger than Solomon's temple. But that's not even the glory that God's talking about of how his temple will be filled with his glory. You know what it is? It's when Jesus, God in the flesh, walked on this earth and was in Jerusalem, he would enter into that temple and fill it with his glory. Oh, God has shaken us. And the reality is there's one other thing on this juice we've all got to be aware of. There's something here called an expiration date. And that expiration date that after that date, this juice, it's not quite that good. You you don't really want to drink it. We may not want to think about it, but we've got an expiration date. And I don't know when that is, but I know one thing for sure for all of us, it's one week sooner than it was last week. But until that expiration day, when maybe we're not going to be as effective here on earth, until that day, if there is blood pumping in your veins, if there is lung and oxygen in your lungs, then we need to be about the work of the Lord, whatever that is that God has called us to. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. God, this morning, I can just tell this congregation, they're ready. And perhaps, God, you've already been moving and working in and through them. And God, I would just pray for all of us, whatever it is that we need to do, that next little step. Maybe it is to to revive that prayer life of ours or that Bible reading life or, or be just a little bit more bold in our witness to those around us.
But God, today you tell us that we are to pick up our cross and follow you daily. And so God, forgive us if our faith has become so easy, if our Christianity has become so relaxed that it's not even a challenge anymore. God, I pray for revival, not only through this congregation, but throughout our country and our world, that we would see the reality and truth of who you are. And God, today, if there is one who needs to come to you as Lord and Savior, I pray they would be bold enough to make that statement. Or one who would want to join and be a part of this great congregation or even rededicate their life. But Lord, even as we will be singing here in a moment, I just pray that you will do work in and through us. Bring a person to mind, bring an activity to mind, bring something to mind that each of us can do to grow a little bit. And God, when you shake us, may we thank you for it. May we be bold enough to pray. Shake us, God. Oh, shake us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.